Okay, praise the Lord. It's good to be in the Lord's house. If you have your Bibles, uh, well, we're, we're going to turn, uh, we're going to begin in 1 Thessalonians, but before we get there, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, we've been, we've been uh, talking about prayer, about prayer. Uh, I, I believe that God wants His church to be a praying church. Uh, God wants His church to be a praying church. And uh, He said, Jesus said, My house shall be called the house of prayer. My house shall be called the house of prayer. And of course, after that, He said, You have made it a den of thieves. If you remember, when Jesus went into the, to the temple, uh, at the end of His ministry, He actually did it twice. He did it at the beginning of His ministry. And he did it at the end. They were in the temple and they were selling, buying and selling. They turned it into kind of a flea market. And uh, they, you know, Jesus went in and cast them out. And he said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. What, it's, it's, it's something to me that we have lost. And I myself have found myself, times in my, in my Christian walk, I have found myself where I have, I have neglected my prayer life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And uh, when we talk about prayer life, okay, prayer life, some people will say it's a spiritual discipline. Well, I don't think that's a good, I don't think that's a good definition. Because when we talk about prayer, what are we talking about? We're talking about communing in the spiritual realm. You know, when we have a conversation with one another, we talk with one another, we exchange information and talk back and forth, you know. Uh, and that's what we do with God. And that's what, some people do that with other spiritual entities that aren't God, okay? Because any, any communication in the spiritual realm is, could be considered prayer. Uh, and, and I think when we, when we talk about it as a spiritual discipline, it really kind of, it's not a good definition. Because just imagine this. Just imagine I would wake up in the morning and say, okay, I've got to talk to my wife ten times today. Let's see, I'll talk to her, I'll talk to her, let's see, I'll talk to her around eight o'clock around breakfast, and maybe, maybe I'll slip something in around 10, and I'll make sure that at the end of the day, I'm going to count and make sure I talk to my wife 10 times, you know, spiritual discipline, right? I've, I've got to get it, I mean, I've got to talk to my wife 10 times a day, right? Now, now that, wouldn't, that wouldn't work too well, would it? Okay. You know, we, we have open communication. Uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I, that's where we're going to begin this morning, talking about prayer. I want to encourage us to be a house of prayer. We have prayer meetings on Thursday night. We have intercessory prayer meetings. We've been uh, the, the last Sunday of every evening, uh, uh, last Sunday of every month, Sunday evening. We want to make it a time of prayer and praise, a time of uh, uh, corporate prayer where we can seek the Lord. There are different kinds of prayer. And it's important for a body, a, a church, to be a praying church. But I, I say this all the time. If you're going to come here to pray, make sure you pray at home. Because God wants us to speak to Him all the time. He wants us to have a constant, open channel between He and us. See, that's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, uh, in verse 17, toward the end of that, of that chapter, toward the end of that letter that he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, one of his earliest letters, maybe, one, maybe the first letter that he wrote chronologically, he says this, three words, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now again, I go back to the uh, example of Rose and myself. You know, we're not constantly talking to one another. Okay? I, and, and, you know, when we live in a house together and we see each other all day long. We're not constantly talking, but we're always open to talk, usually. Okay? <laughs> we are. We're always open to talk. <laughs> Now, she, I'm, look, she's smiling, so I'm okay. <laughs> I better watch myself. I've got to make sure that she's smiling back there. We're, we're always open to, to communicate. You know, we can be passing in the kitchen, and, and one will say, and we'll listen, usually. <laughs> we'll listen, and, and we communicate. Well, when Paul says pray without ceasing, you know, prayer isn't the constant, uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's not that. It's that having a constant, open channel with God so that he can speak to us, you know, I mean, when we think of prayer, we think of us talking to Him. But prayer is a two-way street. It's us talking to Him and Him talking to us. Amen. So when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, he said, pray without ceasing. He says, always never be in a position where God can't tap you on the shoulder. Never get yourself in a place, mentally or spiritually, where you're not open to hearing from God. I and mean, we're quick to pray to Him. Let us get in trouble or in some kind of bondage and say, oh, Lord, you know. 
But he wants us to be as open to him as he is to us. He wants us to be, our ears to be open, our spiritual senses to be open, just as he is to us. Because there could be times God could speak to you. You could be walking down the street and God might say something to you. He might say, go talk to that person over there. See, if you're not listening, if you're not in that position of, 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 of receiving, then, then you won't hear him. Just like, you know, if I'm watching the news and my wife tries to talk to me, and sometimes I don't hear. You know, you know how, that, yeah, how that is. Some of you know how that is. We've got to always have our ears open. Always have our ears open. That's why Paul says, pray without ceasing. And the very next verse, and, I, and this kind of stood out to me this week as I was reading and as I was studying a little bit, is that very, very often when you read about prayer, you read about thanksgiving. Prayer and thanksgiving. Prayer and thanksgiving. In a few days we're going to be celebrating thanksgiving. A, a holiday peculiar to America. Because we, supposedly, what we're supposed to be doing on Thanksgiving is thanking God for being in America. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I live in America. Amen. I might not like everything that's going on right now. I might not like who won the election. It doesn't matter. I thank God that I can stand up on a street corner and preach the gospel and somebody's going to come by and shoot me. At least nobody officially, anyway. <laughs> somebody... When you're in New, Can New Canyon, you never know what's going to happen. I saw a good friend of mine pastors a church out in, out in Apollo, and he, he hit a deer. And I said, out in Apollo, you've got to worry about deer. In New Kensington, you've got to worry about <laughs> shells. But it's different. But, okay, it, it, the thing is, if, if we're not open to the Lord, we pray with thanksgiving because Paul says in verse 18, right after he says about pray without ceasing, in everything, in everything, Everything. Now, Paul didn't have Thanksgiving Day. He didn't have the history of the pilgrims and our nation and the liberty. He didn't have that. In fact, Paul was constantly being chased, persecuted. He was writing to a church in Thessalonica, if you read the book of Acts. When he was in Thessalonica, he planted a church there. He preached the gospel and he left. And it came under all kinds of persecution. In fact, many of them... Uh, had, had died, if you, if you, or some of them had died. If you go back to chapter 4, they were asking about Christians who had died and so forth. And that's another message. But, but they, they were undergoing persecution. They didn't have the liberty and the freedom to practice their faith. They were being persecuted by the Jews, and eventually they would be persecuted by the Romans. And so they, were being, they didn't have the freedom and liberty. But yet he said, in everything, give Thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God wants to have an open communication with us constantly, and He doesn't want to do it to hear us complain. Amen. Remember last week we were talking about when they were coming through the wilderness? And the children of Israel would murmur and complain every time something bad would happen. They'd say, we're going back to Egypt. And they'd blame Moses, and they'd blame Aaron. And they'd say, Aaron, Moses, and Aaron, they brought us out here to die in the wilderness. And God, God didn't like that. I mean, he doesn't mind when we, when we pray and we come to him and we say, Lord, and we bring concerns that we have. That's one thing. But when we start to complain, you know, there's a difference. There's a difference between saying, Lord, and, and we have a concern and, and things are happening. And there's a difference when we go say, God, why did you just... Okay. You know, it's, it's one thing, if, again, if you if put it on a personal level with your, with your loved ones, with your family members. How many people here like to hear people complain all the time? Now, if somebody comes and says, you know, please pray with me, because I got that's one thing, and we'll pray, and it's good. But if, if somebody comes, and all they're doing all the time is like, oh, 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 oh. you want to say, uh, excuse me, I, gotta, I have an appointment. Okay, you know what I'm saying, all right? God's the same way. He wants to hear us. He wants to hear our needs. He wants, to, he wants us to come to him. We're going to read in a little bit. He wants to bring our prayers and our supplications to him with thanksgiving, but he doesn't necessarily want to hear us murmur and complain. There's a difference. There's a difference. He says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Whatever you're going through, he doesn't say for everything, because there's some things that happen you can't be thankful for. When you get the bad report from the doctor, you can't, can't be thankful for that. Thank you, Lord, I came back positive. You can't be thankful for that. But in that, in whatever struggle you find yourself in, 
Whatever dilemma you find yourself in, whatever, whatever thing that's going on, if you learn how to be thankful to God, He will give you the answer. He'll show you, He'll give you direction. It might not come right away, but He will show you the answer. We're going to see it in a minute. We pray without ceasing. We have this constant line of commu communication open with our Father. And we give Him thanks. And we give Him thanks. Gratitude. Even if we can't see the end of the result, even if we can't see the answer to the prayer, we thank Him anyway because we know He's our God. And He said nobody can take us out of His hand. And He said if we seek first the kingdom of God, all these things. That's God's Word. That's what we need to communicate when we pray. You know, there was a time in my life when we were going through a hard time, and it's when Rose first got diagnosed with cancer. And I couldn't pray anything. I was so, I was so wiped out. This was back in 97, 98. I was so wiped out. And the only thing I could do, pray, and I, you know, I, I, I didn't complain to God, but I, I would open up the Bible, and I couldn't really pray, so I would just read His Word to Him. I pray his word back to him. You ever do that? You know, you can do that. You can pray his word back to, back to the Lord. I would open up to Matthew chapter uh, 6, and it would say, Lord, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. I said, Lord, I'm sick in your kingdom. That's all I could say. And that's enough. Because I thanked him. I said, Lord, I thank you. I don't know what the future holds, but I thank you. Man, I was, I was a wreck. But, you know, he was faithful. He's faithful to keep us. In the hardest of times, when it seems like everything is falling apart, He's faithful. He's not going to let you fall. You'll still stay. How many people can sit here this morning and look back on their lives and say, I'm still standing? They didn't expect me to. They didn't expect me to make it through the problem. They didn't expect me to make it out of jail. They didn't expect me to get over my addiction. They didn't expect me to get, get through all my family problems. But I'm still standing. And I'm still praising the Lord. Thank the Lord. In everything, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Turn with me now. I'm just going to look at a couple of scriptures. Turn with me now over to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Now when, he, when, when the Apostle Paul wrote Colossians, he was in jail. He was uh, actually on house arrest. And he was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. They didn't have the ankle bracelets in. So they, 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 had, to they had to chain him to a Roman soldier. And uh, for those of you who were here a few weeks ago when, when Brother Shope was here from our, from our state office, he said, you know what, he says, Paul wasn't chained to them soldiers. Them soldiers were chained to Paul. <laughs> okay, but, but listen to what Paul had to say to the church at Colossae. In chapter 4, and look at verse 2. Now listen to what he says. Continue in what? In prayer. Continue in prayer. They were praying for Paul. As a matter of fact, when you start reading the Bible and start looking for places where they pray, there's a lot of prayer that went on in the Bible. There's a lot of prayer. A lot of talking to God. Okay, he said continue in prayer and watch in the same what? With thanksgiving. He's talking about praying He's talking about watching, and he's talking about thanking. Prayer, diligence. When we pray, it says the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man. Our prayer should not be, and in, in, you know how it is. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep, boom, you know, and uh, we say the little rote prayer. But our prayers ought to be heartfelt, diligent, seeking the Lord. Passionate. Intimate. You know, God's not just a passerby, but the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. Our prayers ought to be intimate, ought to be, you know, like you would talk closely to a close friend or a loved one. He says, continue in prayer and watch in the same what? With thanksgiving. With all praying for us, Paul, here's the Apostle Paul. Well, why do we have to pray for him? He's writing the, the Bible, for goodness sake. He's as close as, to God as anybody can get. But Paul was asking this, this church at Colossae, these Colossians, he's saying, pray for me. Wow, pray for me. You know what? You can ask people to pray for you. 
Thank God we got people who will pray. And I'm going to tell you something. Let me give you a little piece of advice. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, could you please pray for me? Pray for them. There. Because you know what I found out with me? If somebody comes up and says, pray for me, and I say, I'll pray for you. And then I'll go, and in like five minutes, that person will be so far from mine. That's why I got to grab their hand, and I said, let's pray. I used to work over Allegheny Lutham, and guys would come up to me. You know, I, my machine was like in the back, right? And they'd come up to me, and they'd say, and, they, and, and they, would, they would always like kind of kid around a lot, but when they had a need, they would, they, they would come to me. And they would, say, they would say, hey, could you pray? You know, my wife is sick. I said, let's pray. They said, what? I said, so you say, you want to pray? Let's pray. And they were like, and they look around like anybody looking, you know, okay. <laughs> I pray with them. But, but that's what, that's what if, if, if you're going to pray, if somebody says pray for me, please pray for them. Pray for them right then and there, okay? Listen to what he says. The Apostle Paul said, praying also for us that God, what, what, what do you want to pray? Pray that I, uh, uh, you know, pray that I get out of jail. He didn't say that. Pray that, you know, I hit the lottery. He didn't say that. They don't have a lottery back. Pray that, you know, pray that, uh, he, he said, look, here's what he wanted. Here's, here, here, here was Paul's passion. Pray for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Paul said, pray that I get the opportunity to share my faith. And, and listen, here's what, was, here's what was going on. Paul had appealed, and if you read the book of Acts, it's a big long story, Paul had appealed to Caesar. He was being accused of things he had not done, and he made an appeal to Caesar. So that, and Paul was a Roman citizen, so he had the right to go to appear before Caesar. So here he was on house arrest, chained uh, 24 hours a day to Roman guards, waiting to, to stand before the craziest guy on the earth at that time, whose name was Nero. Nero had a bad day. He'd have your head chopped off for nothing. That's the way he was. But Paul wanted, he said, pray for me that I would have an opportunity to share my faith. And he knew he was going to stand before the most powerful man on the earth at that time. Just imagine if you, God, give me an opportunity to stand in front of Barack Obama and share my faith. That's what he was saying. He said, pray for me. Don't pray I get out of jail. Don't pray I get out of here and scot free. He said, pray that I get a I get a chance that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Paul said, pray for me that I can share the gospel. That I can share the gospel. That was his purpose. That was his reason for being. When God arrested him on the road to Damascus, he told him all the things he was going to suffer for his name's sake. Paul said, pray for me. Pray and watch in thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. One more verse, and one more passage, and it's, it's one that we probably all are familiar with. Over there, another prison epistle, over there in Philippians. We've read this and preached on this so many times. But you see, it's, it's, I really believe it's the key. For those of us who are born again and saved, we have an avenue whereby we can speak, we can go boldly to the throne of grace. My goodness. Don't even need a pass. It's already been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Listen. We all, we all know this, Pastor. Look at verse 4. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 4 in Philippians. It says this. Another prison epistle. He's, he's writing this from being chained to a Roman soldier. He says... Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. We sing that song, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. It's a nice song to sing in church, but sing it when you're chained to a Roman soldier. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always, and I, again I say rejoice. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It's, I really believe, you know, if we were going to put this in today's vernacular, he would say, chill out. <laughs> Cut the drama. <laughs> Anybody hear of a drama? You know, drama. He said, let your moderation be. The Lord, listen, God's in control. You know, some of you know, yeah, I'm, on, I'm, I'm on Facebook, you know. So before the election, there, there was all kinds of stuff on Facebook about this and that and everything. Okay, and, and, and I, but after the election, I said, hey, it's done. Chill out. 
Pray. <laughs> but nothing we can do about it now. We can't kick him out. Pray. Chill out. Pray for him. Pray for his salvation. Well, wouldn't that be something? If he got saved, wouldn't that be something? Not just him for all of them up there in the Senate and Congress. I don't know how many of them know the Lord. I don't think a whole lot of them. But pray for them. Okay, but listen, he says, let your moderation be made known to, unto all men. And some people might disagree with my little paraphrase there, but that's all right. The Lord is at hand. Now look, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. You know how we are. My wife will tell you how I am. I'll worry, if I let myself, I'll worry at the drop of a hat. Okay, I mean, I'm just, I was like kind of programmed that way. It, it, growing up, I had, you know, I've told this before, my mother, she worried about everything. If she didn't have nothing to worry about, she would make something up to worry about. And tell everybody about it, and try to get everybody else to worry about it too. You know, oh, she get, you know, pull her hair out and get crying, drama, you know, <laughs> and I would be like, chill out. She would say, he says, he says, don't worry, be careful for nothing. Now, now here, here it is. Listen. In everything, there it is again. In everything. In whatever situation you're in, whatever report you got from the doctor, whatever, whatever's going on in Washington, whatever's going on in Israel, pray, hey, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. My goodness, Psalm 83 war, I think, is getting ready to go on over in Israel. You know, and a lot of people are wringing their hands about it. I'm not worried about it. They're going to win. That's what the Bible says. Right? Right? whether we help them or not, by the way. I mean, I want to help them, but, okay, but listen. He says, in everything, there it is, in everything. By what? By prayer and supplication. There's like two words there that are very, very close to each other, but one is much more uh, intense than the other. Prayer is our general communication with God. Supplication is the crying out. Crying out. Sometimes you've got to cry out to God. Sometimes things look so impossible and so imp just beyond any uh, imagination it's going to be okay. You've got to cry out to God. He says, listen, don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. That means we thank Him before we see the answer. That means we thank Him before we know the answer. That means in everything, give thanks. We're coming up on Thanksgiving. A lot of folks come up to Thanksgiving, they think about turkey, sweet potatoes, football game. That's not what Thanksgiving is about. Every day ought to be Thanksgiving for the believer. I mean, I eat turkey every day, but every day ought to be Thanksgiving for the believer. Because every day we got something to be thankful for. Every day we got something to be thankful in. Every day we can praise the Lord just for saving, of it, saving us, if nothing else. We can thank Him for the promises in His Word about what's going to happen in Israel, what's going to happen in the world. The things that we see happening, the things that we see coming to pass that were prophesied thousands of years ago, the things that we see going on, we can be thankful for that. We can be thankful that He has revealed it to us in His Word. There's so many things we can be thankful for. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, with prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving. Listen to what He says. Let your requests be made known to God. We can ask Him. Some people, some people say, I've heard this so many times. Oh, God's not worried about that. Oh. God is concerned about everything in your life. You know that? He's concerned about everything in your life. He's con Listen, when, when, when your heart begins to churn, I mean, anybody ever get that feeling in the pit of your stomach when something goes wrong? You all know what I'm talking about. He's concerned. He's concerned. When, when, when everything looks... And see, here's, I've said this so many times, and some of you have heard it a million times, you'll hear it one more time today. The thing that you're going through, to you, is the worst it can be. Because a lot of people will think, and I've thought this, well, uh, you know, I'm going through this, but that's not like what so-and-so is going through. What they're going through is real bad. You know what? In God, God is concerned about what you're going through. It might not be as bad as what somebody else is going through, but He's still concerned about what you're dealing with. He says, 
Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. We're told that we can go boldly to the throne of grace in Hebrews. We don't have to pass through the veil anymore. It was ripped in half. We don't have to bring blood of bulls and goats and rams and lambs. We don't have to do it. was done once for all when Christ went to the cross. When he shed his blood on the cross, he opened up the door that we could go to him anytime. In fact, it opened up the door that He wants us to be with Him all the time. Not just when things aren't going good. But He wants to be able to communicate with us all the time. Not just, you know. We'll read it. And we'll finish. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And what will happen? See, when I, and, and again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to when, when Rose was first diagnosed with her lymphoma cancer. You know the first thing I did? Some of you know it because I've said it before. Did I get on my knees and start praying? No. The first thing I did, I got on the internet and looked up lymphoma cancer. Let me give you some advice. If you ever get that, if you ever get that diagnosis, don't get on the internet and look it up. Don't look it up. Because, <laughs> well, according to the stuff I read on the internet, she shouldn't be here now. <laughs> See, my God had a different plan. Amen. See, if I had kept my eyes off the internet, I probably would have had a lot more peaceful time <laughs> than what I had. But I started reading what, what they had to say about it, and I said, oh, 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 oh man. When we make our requests known to Him, stay off the internet, stay off the telephone, get, get away from the, all the books, get away from Dr. Phil. When we get away from all that stuff, here's what will happen. When we pray to Him, the peace of God, not the peace I can give you, not the peace that any doctor or any psychologist or any even preacher can give you, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Nobody can figure it out. I can't figure out how some people can go through things and still have a smile on their face and still have joy in their heart. Well, I, well, I can't figure it out now. But at one time, how can they go through this with, that, with all that going on? Why? Because they didn't turn to the world. They didn't, turn to, they didn't turn to science. They didn't turn to medicine. I'm not against doctors. Please don't misunderstand me. But they didn't, they didn't get, try to get their advice or their peace. Because you know, I'll tell you what, the doctor won't give you any peace. He'll tell you the truth. He'll tell you what it's all about. He won't give you peace. But the only place you'll get peace, when you go to our, our Heavenly Father, our Abba, the one who sent His Son to shed His blood for us, the one who said we could, because of the blood of Jesus, we could come to Him anytime. It says, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's why I want to be a house of prayer. That's why I want my church to be a house of prayer. That's why I want, I want, I want where, whether we meet here or wherever or whatever, I, I want our congregation to be a place where people can come and find peace, not because I have nice words to tell them. I mean, you can call me up. I'll pray with you. I'll try, to, I'll try to comfort you the best I can. But I can't give you the peace of God. Only He can give it. I can lead you there. I can show you how. I can say, look, look, here's what the Word says. And I say, let's pray God's Word. Let's look at God's Word. Let's, I, can, I, can, I can lead you there. But I can't give you peace. Only God can give peace. Only He can give peace that goes beyond our comprehension, but we can fathom. I don't understand. God, I don't understand why I'm going through this. The Apostle Paul says, finally, brethren, in verse 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, are just, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Here. This is, this is, that's what's in here. 
this, with, with all that stuff he just said there? You, you know what? I have not watched Fox News for... <laughs> you won't find peace there. You won't find peace on CNN. You won't find peace... I got tired of watching local news. There's no peace there. There's no hope there. They just tell you about all the miserable stuff that's going on. All the things that are honest. Be nothing honest on TV. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. Man, there sure ain't nothing pure on there. Our, our, our entertainment, our world is filled with filth. There's no peace there. They'll just stir you up. They'll just stir up the evil in you. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. I haven't heard a good report on TV for you know, good report. Good reports don't sell cars. Bad reports do all this. You know, bad report sells, all right? All these things we find right here because the Apostle Paul said, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace will be with you. We need peace. How many people would need peace? I need peace this morning. You know what? I've looked everywhere. Before I got saved, I got saved when I was 30 years old. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find peace. Tried to get high. Couldn't find peace. Tried drinking. Couldn't find peace. Looking around for women. Couldn't find peace. Couldn't, couldn't find, I couldn't find it. Looked everywhere. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd watch, I'd, I'd, read, I'd read books uh, about, you know, about mental, uh, you know, psychology and uh, how, how to be happy. And, and I, couldn't find, I couldn't find peace anywhere. Maybe for a little bit. You know, you go out and party a little bit and you have a good time. You have some peace until the next morning. And the, that peace was gone. It wasn't there anymore. You know, hang out with some folks. You know. Have, 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 have some fun for a little while. But then the next day come around, everything be the same. It may be worse, if, depending on what you did the night before. The only place I found peace, you know what? Is in the arms of Jesus Christ. It's the only... I've, 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 told, I've told the testimony before. That guy handed me a track one time. You probably get sick of hearing it. He handed me a track and had a picture of Jesus with a, with a little lamb in his arm. You know? A little picture. I took that track, I folded it up, I, I shoved it in a drawer. About six months later, I looked at that track and I said, man, that little lamb is in the best place he could be. I didn't know who Jesus was. But I figured he was, he was better than what I knew. <laughs> God opened up the door for me to understand that the only place I could find hope, the only place I could find peace is in the arms of Jesus Christ. That's where I want to be. And you know what? If I'm in his arms, I can talk to him anytime. And I can hear him anytime. See, it's not... It's not, a, it's not a discipline. It's a relationship. That's what prayer is. That's when I say, Lord, make my church the house of prayer. I'm not looking for, you know, folks to commit, commit to pray four hours a day. No. I want to foster a relationship where we can talk to God anytime. And we can hear Him anytime. See, you know what? I'm, I'm finding out. I want, I want to hear him more than I want to talk to him. I want to hear what he has to say. Because when I talk to him, it usually ends up, if I'm not careful, I'm complaining about something. But, but if I just keep my mouth shut, be still and know that I am God, that's what I want. I want my church, I want my congregation to be the, the house of prayer. I want a place where we can foster that relationship so that not only when we come on a Thursday night or on a, or on a Sunday evening when we have prayer, but when we're driving in our car, when we're walking down the street, when we're sitting in the kitchen, when we're, we'll be open to hear. And we'll be able to say, yes, Abba, yes, yes. It's like, remember the story in the Old Testament, little Samuel was a young man and his mother had devoted him to the work of the Lord. And the high priest at that time was a guy named Eli. You can read about this in 1 Samuel, first couple chapters. 
Eli was a good priest, but his sons were rotten. And God wasn't going to let his sons take over. So little Samuel, just a young, young lad, maybe just, just a, you know, maybe five, six years old, he was laying in bed and he heard a voice. He said, Samuel. And Samuel thought it was Eli calling him. So Samuel got up and said, yes, Mr. Eli. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And went back to bed, heard it again. He said, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, yes. Eli says, I didn't call you. Eli said, listen, the next time you hear that voice, say, yes, Lord. What is it you want? Here I am. God is waiting for us to say, here I am. Here I am. When he calls us, here I am. Will you go for me? Here I am. Will you wait on me? Here I am. Will you allow me to give you peace? Here I am. Will you, will you go and, and, and spread my word? Will you, will you love somebody in my name? Here I am. How many people are willing to say, here I am? God, make us a house of prayer. Make us a house where we're willing to listen. When the voice, when we hear the voice, when we sense the presence of God, we'll say, here I am. Here I am. How many would say that this morning? Here I am, God. You know, I thank God. I, I, I failed to mention earlier, our brother John Shelton is in Cuba right now. He heard God's voice say, go to Cuba. He said, here I am. That's where he is. He'll be coming home Tuesday. Pray for him. He'll be coming home Tuesday. Father, help us. Help us be open. I, I'm going to pray this morning. And we're going to close. We're going to close in prayer. You know, as a pastor of a church. I thank God for those people who have said, here, here I am. Who have come forth and who have worked in the body, in the congregation. For nothing. For no, no remuneration, no pay. Just because they've answered God. And I want to pray this morning that God would raise up... You see... see I pray that God would raise up people who are willing to say, here I am. I, I, I don't know, you know, we're all called to be witnesses. Not everybody's called to be a preacher. Not everybody's called to be an evangelist. Not everybody's called to be a But we're all called to be witnesses. I pray, Lord, this morning that we would open up our hearts and open up our minds and we'll say, Lord, here I am. We might not know. Maybe you have not revealed to us the will that you have for us, what, what you have for us. But Lord, how many would here this morning just raise their hand and say, here I am. Here I am. I want to listen to you. I want to hear your voice. I want to have a relationship with you, Lord, that I, I could hear your voice. I know you hear me, but Lord, I want to hear you. Won't you stand, please, as we close?